estates who died in the crash and they leave behind two little children. The families have asked us to come here today because they feel that they are not being taken into consideration or being allowed to have a voice in what is happening. First, I want to say that the district attorney in Schoharie County did a tremendous job. She fought a motion to dismiss. She did a wonderful job with that. And uh, we do want to commend her for the work that has been done. However, at this point, our clients do not feel that their voices are being heard. And they have lost so much that they wanted us to become their voices for them here today. One of the things that has not come to light or has not been talked about is why there is a plea bargain. What are the facts of the case? And we would like to ask that there be an elocution from the defendant if a plea is going to be accepted. And that elocution should include all of the facts of the case. That, that should include the fact that he should be talking about what happened at Mavis with regard to that limousine. Not only what happened, but what was said, what was done, why there is paperwork that shows that work was done on the master cylinder when it was not done on the master cylinder. And we want to ask this question, and we would like an answer to this, and our clients would like an answer to this. If Mavis carries responsibility, which we are being led to believe is true, then why are they not being indicted? And why are the people from Mavis not being indicted? What were those conversations? What happened with regard to that? Our clients at this point feel that they are being misinformed. They have not, even to today, been informed that there is a plea bargain. They have not been given any opportunity to have a voice. They were asked to submit in writing victim impact statements. They want to appear in court. They want to say their say in court. They all believe that there should not be a plea bargain and they would like this case to go to trial. That is not our responsibility as civil attorneys to make that decision. That is a decision that has to be made by the district attorney and we have to rely upon her to make that. But what we would like is to give back a voice to the people who have had such great losses in this, in this horrendous crash. We will be doing um, questions at the end, but we're going to give all of the attorneys an opportunity to speak. So whoever wants to go next. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Mortati. I'm at Martin Harding Mazzotti. I represent the estate of Savannah Bersessi. Uh, I echo everything that uh, Cynthia Lefebvre just told you all. And first of all, I want to thank you for coming this afternoon. It's vitally important in this process if, in fact, a plea actually happens, as Cynthia mentioned, that we have an allocution that explains everything that not only happened with Mavis, but the documentation for this vehicle through the New York State Department of Transportation as well. This is additional necessary information that we need, and we need this information through an allocution, which is the proper way of doing this, in our opinion, to assist our clients, the victims of this. And like I said, I represent Savannah Bersessi's estate, a, uh, a wonderful young soul among a number of souls that perished on that fateful day. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Primo, and I represent uh, Mary Ashton, uh, who is in representation of her deceased son, who was a Marine that served our country. She gave an interview today where she resides in Maine, and I believe this all came to a head today because she felt victimized again by this process. She had conversations with the DA's office, and while I have openly commended the DA's office for her efforts to uh, oppose a dismissal of this action, the criminal case against uh, the operator of the vehicle. Uh, Mary Ashton feels that she was misinformed and that the DA was being underhanded with her. And she asked me to speak on her behalf, and she spoke for herself today. That again, she feels that she's being left out of the process and that 
the memory of her son is being disrespected. We don't attempt to get involved in the criminal process or criminal justice system. My client fully understands that any discretion or decisions with respect to a prosecution is solely within the discretion of the district attorney's office. My client fully understands that sentencing of any defendant is solely within the prerogative of the court. But under New York State law, all the surviving family members are defined as victims with victim rights. And my client felt up until this very moment, over the last month or so, that her rights as a victim have been trampled on. She doesn't believe that the DA was informing her properly. In fact, she believes the DA was trying to enter into a plea deal without disclosing the existence of negotiations and without disclosing the existence of a factual plea deal that was being negotiated and proposed. And in fact, two weeks ago, it came to a head because she felt fully, as she does now, that the DA and the defense in that case were trying to arrange a plea deal that would result in probation without any input by the victims. And that was not acceptable to her. And she thereafter engaged in further conversations with the victim's rights advocate, as well as the DA's office, only to be befuddled further. She's not happy. She wants the court to know she's not happy. And she wants the court to know she has a right to speak and that she intends to speak. I've explained to her under New York State law, as a victim, she has a right to speak and to be known, have her position be known to the court prior to sentencing. She understands she can't stop any plea deal. She's not trying to, but she does intend to be heard in this case. And I think it would be, as an attorney on a civil case, and I do a lot of criminal practice, and many of us do, and many of us used to be prosecutors, I think it would be an abomination in this case with 20 deceased individuals, with surviving children and parents and spouses and relatives and loved ones, for the victim's rights and voices to be left out of any proposed plea agreement, and particularly with respect to any sentencing proposed to the court. Thank you very much. Hello. My name is Sal Ferlazzo, Gerben and Ferlazzo, F-E-R-L-A-Z-Z-O. I represent the estate of Amanda Rivenberg. I echo everything everyone said. I won't be repetitive, but I just want you to understand that when a criminal process occurs and there's a plea of guilty and the defendant has to look at the victims, it's very powerful. I sat with defendants, and you sit there, and when they're looking at the victims who've had deaths and other injuries, it's very powerful on the defendant. And for the defendant to be able to walk away from 20 deaths and not even have to share that searing expression in their face is just, it's improper. So I would ask the judge to delay the sentencing and give the opportunity to the victims, if they want, to have them look into the eyes of the defendant and make him feel forever what it feels like to be them. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm George LaMarche, LaMarche Sofranco, L-A-M-A-R-C-H-E. I represent the family of Amanda Hulse. You know, there's a couple of different processes that are going on right now. We have the civil justice process and we have the criminal justice process. And the civil justice process is far from over, and we have a long way to go in that case. And it sounds like we're reaching the end of the criminal justice process, a process that the families all deserve an opportunity to be heard in. And they don't feel like they've had that opportunity. The only way for them to really know if what's happening is fair is if there is transparency. I respect the district attorney's office and the efforts she's put into this case, but the families need to know more and they need to have an opportunity to be heard about the impact that this defendant has caused on all of their lives. And unless they get that opportunity, justice is not being served. Thank you. Hi. My name is Jeffrey Francisco, F-R-A-N-C-I-S-C-O, an attorney in Amsterdam, and I represent the estates of the King sisters. It is the position of Tom and Linda King, the mother of the King girls, and has always been that this case should go to trial. 
we respect the, the plea bargaining process, but in the case of this significance, the criminal case, uh, as we see in a lot of cases nationally, galvanizes the situation. The civil cases to follow um, do not have potentially that significance in that weight that a criminal case uh, has. They would respect any outcome that a jury would have, even if it is not guilty, but we do believe that there should have been and should be a public uh, jury, criminal jury trial with the airing of all the facts and a record established for the benefit of the posterity of all their lives and the children, the surviving children uh, that are involved here. Thank you. One of the things that I did fail to mention before and I'd like to mention is that a plea is accepting responsibility. And in this case, we are asking for an allocution because that is part of accepting responsibility. But we also would like the public to be aware of the fact that there is no responsibility being accepted by the defendant in this case because he has not made himself availed of service of the civil action that was commenced. We don't know where he is. We're now told that he is at his girlfriend's house. We don't have an address. We can't serve him. And we asked the criminal defense attorney to accept service, and he said that he was not authorized by his client to do so. So there is no acceptance of responsibility here. And so at the, la at, at the next hearing, I think that our clients are entitled to at least know where is the defendant and um, have the defendant available in person, and if that's not ab something that the court would do, at least by Zoom or some other electronic method. Thank you. And we'll open it up for questions. When did you find out about this potential plea deal? When, you know, when did talks begin between Hussein Hussein's attorney and the DA? Well, there's been uh, scuttlebutt, but now we have really good sources that are giving it to us. So. With regard to the allocution, is that not something that has to happen? It's an option? It's an option. Yes. What is your client's understanding of the exact plea deal that he's being offered? Um, our clients don't know because they have not been given that information. As early as last week, there was a meeting where they were told there was not a plea deal. But it's our understanding that there is. What does civil justice look like if carried out properly? Civil justice means that he will have to face a jury of his peers and he will have to and we will be able to go through all of the facts of this case with all of the parties being heard and we can actually dive down deep enough so that these victims will know what happened to that limousine before their loved ones got into it and died. So the primary objective would be closure for the defendant, correct? Yes. With regard to, I know many of you prosecuted Anybody before, else just curious, uh, looking from the standpoint of the Spokane County DA, why, why go for a deal at this point? It seems like there's a massive amount of evidence, obviously. Why, why go for a deal? I, 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 me personally, uh, I don't think it's for any of us to talk about. That's that's the criminal justice system. That's the DA's prerogative. Again, this all arose today from our perspective, and our clients asked us to speak on their behalf with respect to their civil claims for their loved ones that are now deceased because they felt that they were being told that the case in the criminal action was proceeding to trial. And they all want a trial. The ones, at least my client does and the people she has spoken to, expected a trial and wanted a trial and they wanted to see the case play out in, in the court system. And there were discussions had between our clients and the DA's office or the DA herself and victim rights advocates. And based on those conversations, my client firmly believed that the case was going to trial until she asked me about why she was being asked to put in a victim statement. And the mechanism that came about, how it came about, and, and how the proceeding was playing out, which was to give a statement to the DA's office or the crime victim's liaison advocate 
to be filed with the court as opposed to the probation department contacting them. But she was under the distinct impression that the case was going to trial. Only after she talked with me and mentioned the fact that there was a proposed plea, pre, plea, pre, plea sentence investigation did this all come about. And then she had further conversations with the DA that was more confusing, that were more confusing to her. And then at one point in time, she tells me that the DA admitted to her after several direct questions that there were, that they were negotiating and there might be a plea bargain and there might be a plea deal that was entered on the record that included only probation and perhaps time served because he was at home. But again, we're not here and my client's not here to, to double get, you know, to, to, to speak for the DA or to get into the DA's, you know, prerogatives relative to prosecution or plea agreement or anything like that. But she is a victim relative to victim rights and she has a right to be informed properly and to be told what is happening in the case. And so that she's not deprived of her opportunity to allow the court to hear her voice with respect to what she believes should happen in a sentencing. And also, frankly, with what she believes should happen with the criminal case itself, for example, to either have a plea deal or to go to trial. And again, keep in mind my client, again, I'm only speaking for my client because that's the only person I've talked to, but my client had the distinct impression that she was not being informed properly and that she was being in fact misinformed so that the effort would be, she would not have the ability to speak as a victim with respect to either a plea deal or a sentencing in this case. Again, the issue was, are they negotiating a plea deal? She was not giving any information about that. Are you setting up a virtual plea and or even a plea appearance with sentencing on the same day because you have negotiated a plea deal or you are negotiating one? And I have a right to know. And that was her position. And that's how this came about. So again, I don't want to confuse the two things. The DA obviously has a right to do what she wants to do with the case, but my client's position is then you should inform us clearly and we should have a right to participate in that process. Right? So again, I don't think we as civil attorneys should have... Understood, but you also are reflecting your client's wishes and it sounds like they wanted a trial. My client this very moment wants a trial. My client, I'll make it very clear. My client does not want a plea deal. My client wants a trial. My client wants to see the owner operator in the criminal case. She wants to be there. And if he's convicted, she wants to have a say in sentencing. And if he's not convicted, she accepts that. But she is not happy with the way the process went and she feels her rights as a victim were being deprived. Does it sound like the judge in the Texas case is trying to avoid impact figures, trying to avoid facing victims? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Does it seem like they're trying to avoid impact figures, trying to avoid facing the victims at sentencing? I can speak for my client's impression. My client's impression was that the DA was not telling her what was happening so that she was not involved in the process. She did not know there were any negotiations. She was led to believe that there were not negotiations. She did not know there was a prospect of a plea deal. She was led to believe that there was a trial coming up. And then she was asked to put in a victim's impact statement. But she was told that probation would not be contacting her, that she would give it to the victim's advocate, and that that statement would then go to the court. And she was later told, when she questioned the DA more about it because of her confusion, that the court would consider that sentencing or that statement if the defendant ever did anything again, which again led her then to believe that there was in fact a plea deal that was worked out and they were anticipating entering that plea deal and anticipating a sentence and that would not include anything but probation. So that was her concern then. That's her concern now. And if that is the case, then yes, she would have been left out of the process essentially, unless the court gave her an opportunity to speak prior to sentencing, which I don't believe the court would not have done. But the way it was proposed to her was that in fact it probably wouldn't be done. So again, that's her conversations with the DA. She's not trying to speak for the court. In fact, 
part of the reason why she wanted me to come forward and she came forward today was because she wants the court to know that she does want to participate in this process. Are there legal ramifications for not including victims in that process or is it just cultural? If you mean broad scope, you know, if there's any remedies, no, not really. Again, the DA and the court and the defendant are the three parties involved in the case and victims do have certain rights, but mainly it's the right to be informed and the right to be heard and they don't direct the prosecutions and they don't direct sentencing. But obviously in this day and age, like we had down in New York City with the Epstein case where a judge gave an entire day for victims to come in in a federal court to speak and be heard, even though the defendant was deceased. And many people are saying today and applauding that act as the gold standard of how to treat victims, right? So I think if that's the gold standard of how to treat victims, I can't think of a worse standard to treat victims than to not keep them totally informed and in fact have conversations with lay people that confuses them rather than clarifies the process, right? Are there any complications or implications for a plea deal on the civil case? Who wants to address that? George, do you want to? Sure. Yes. So if the defendant admits his role in this, then that will have an effect on the civil proceeding. To the extent that he is also being sued, that can be used against him in the civil proceeding as an admission against him. Yes. So that will impact his role in the civil proceeding. It won't impact the roles of others and there's more than one entity here who is responsible, more than one potential defendant who is responsible here, but it will solidify his role in this and at least in part his responsibility in causing the deaths here. You know, the question was asked about allocution earlier. I would expect in county court there would be an allocution. The question is to what extent are they going to require him to allocute? How much is he going to say? Is he going to barely satisfy the elements of the offense or is he really going to say what his role was in this? And if he's going to accept responsibility, he should accept full responsibility by admitting exactly what his role was and not just satisfy the elements of the offense. The families deserve to know what his role was in this offense completely and transparency would allow that to happen and at this point they just don't feel that they have been fully informed about what this defendant's role is in the case and without knowing that they really can't have a full input as to whether or not they think the plea deal that's been offered is fair. I know that there are many of the families here who don't want to see this happen. My family wants to see justice happen and if justice means the defendant admits to what he did and he receives a plea bargain because that's what's fair and that's what's just and that's what's appropriate then they're behind that because the discretion is in the DA's office who is prosecuting this case. But more information would allow that to happen, to allow them to be fully informed about this offer and if it's a fair offer and if this is what should be happening. You know, pushing this quickly, I know this has been going on for some time, but pushing this along quickly, you know, on a Friday we learn of it, this is supposed to be happening on Monday, the family has not been given an opportunity to submit their victim impact statements, at least my family hasn't or don't feel that they have and now they're not being allowed to go and voice the impact that this has had on them and their lives, that's disheartening to them. Any other questions, guys? Have you had any difficulty in contact, I don't know what sort of role you may play in the civil case, you know, getting some of that information from the DA's office? I mean, we've gotten information, we have gotten information, but the DA's office obviously can only release so much information because it's an active and ongoing criminal investigation and criminal prosecution. Susan Mallory has not been difficult with me personally at all. She's responded to any calls that I've had and I appreciate and respect the job that she has to do and the prosecution that she's handling. So to the extent that she could share information, certainly she has with us, but certainly we'll be able to get more information when the case is resolved because it is an ongoing criminal process right now. If I may throw out one more thing, we filed our action very quickly and we've been stopped at every area to try to get information because of the criminal process going forward. There's really no good reason to rush this through. There's simply no good reason and they should give, the judge should give the families the opportunity to see what occurred here and we really need to know, like Cynthia said, what happened to Mavis? It sounds like Mavis was a major factor 
in maybe determining whether to take a plea. So why isn't Mavis having their feet to the fire? So uh, listen, the DA controls things. The judge controls the courtroom, though, and the judge has the discretion to stop the clock and let the families talk. I would ask the judge to do that. I want to add something to that. that that's a great point because um, one of the key facts that happened with my client, again, my client was the one that was having direct communications with the DA's office and the victim rights advocate. And the issue was the pre-plea investigation and why it was being done. And my client has informed me, and I believe she's confirmed with both the DA and the victim's advocate, that the DA's position was that we're doing a pre-plea investigation so that there's no stay between a plea and sentencing. Who cares? There is literally no reason to concern yourself about any time between a plea and sentencing unless you're trying to do it all in one day, right? So at this point in time, what is the purpose to rush this stage of the proceedings? Let the victims talk to probation, let their voice be heard, and let the judge fully have time to consider. You got to understand the process. It's in the statutes for a reason. Probation is an arm of the court. Probation is duty bound to perform what's called a pre-sentencing investigation, where they contact all the victims, gather all the facts, and discuss the defendant and his history and the operative conditions and facts and circumstances of the case so that the, full, the court is fully able to decide whether to accept a plea deal or to whether or what sentence would be appropriate in the case. But part of that process is for the victims to have time to understand everything that's going on and to be able to speak with probation and put their thoughts down and have the opportunity to appear in court. So why, in this particular case, was there any need to propose that a pre-plea investigation would be done so that we could skip that process and at the same time tell my client that that statement would go to the victim rights advocate who would then give it to the court, but she still wasn't told what the process was or what the proposed disposition was or what a proposed sentence might be and that the court would have that sentence in case the defendant did something again later. And I want to make it clear, none of us here are implying that anybody is guilty of anything. We don't know. It's not our, it's not our concern. But if somebody accepts responsibility, as Cynthia has repeatedly said, there's a process to that. And in, in federal court, for example, you have to accept full responsibility or you don't accept responsibility even if you claim you do. And that thing, that entire concept applies to the state process too, right? And that's what Cynthia is talking about. How can you, you can't have it both ways. If you're looking for a plea deal, if that's happening, and if you're going to accept responsibility, then accept responsibility and go through the process and allow these victims their day in court, allow these victims to be heard right in front of you before you are sentenced. And that's how this all came about. There's no, if, if the normal proceeding was happening, I don't think any of this would be going on today. Okay. I just, I just want to say one last thing. Um, there were multiple families involved in this crash and their lives have been altered forever. And all they're asking for is that their voices be heard now. And that's all we're asking for, that their voices be heard now. Thank you. 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 Thank you.